The problem of climate change is ethically complex. Why? Because on one hand, immediate human welfare is at stake. On the other hand, needs of future generations at stake. Fair to somebody who's unborn right now and the person will be born in future. That is 2060. Do you think we owe people of future generations clean air? Do you think we owe people of future generations something called clean water? It's time we got into understanding the ethical issues that plague climate change. Let's start with these issues one by one. As the heat wave intensifies in the country, you will see newspapers carrying stories of extreme temperatures. You'll come across columnists writing on climate change policies, global warming. But what is surprising is these are election times and I have not seen too many political parties in the campaigns or the manifestos mentioning and elaborate or giving out elaborate detail about. And what is surprising is climate change is a reality. It's time we confronted it. And surprisingly, we are trying to brush it under the carpet. And today we'll discuss climate change, not the technical side of it. I'll talk about climate change ethics. I'll talk about climate change decision making, how ethics and values influence something called climate change policies. The moment I mention the word climate change, people have these visuals of scientists giving out data, television channels interviewing uh, commentators or scholars. And what is interesting about the whole issue of climate change is it traverses multiple disciplines. Economists talk about it, scientists talk about it, environmentalists talk about it, international relations experts negotiate on climate change issues. And today, I don't intend to be a scientist or an international relations expert or a TV commentator. I just plan to talk about only one thing, climate change ethics. I'm gonna talk about ethical dilemmas in climate change issues. I'll talk about how climate change protection is a fundamental human right. And lastly, I'll focus my attention on how individuals and local communities can contribute to mitigating climate change effects. And stay tuned because towards the end, I'll take you all to Punjab, where I'll expose you to a very interesting local level initiative that's doing wonders. Let me first start with what does the word climate change mean and how I'm going to use it here. Climate change refers to any change in climate over time, whether due to natural variability or as a result of human activity, known as anthropogenic change. The problem of climate change is ethically complex because it raises concerns not only really regarding human welfare, but also our moral responsibility to protect the environment and future generations. The problem of climate change is ethically complex. Why? Because on one hand, human welfare is at stake. Immediate human welfare is at stake. On the other hand, needs of future generations at stake. So that's why it becomes morally very complex. Immediate needs matter or future needs matter. Before I get into how ethics informs climate change policy making or climate change policy decisions, let me give you an outline of ethical theories that we use to analyze climate change policies and climate change decision making. There are three basic ethical theories. One is utilitarian theory, or we should say utilitarian approach. The second one is deontological, and the last one is virtue ethics, or the virtue approach. The utilitarians strongly believe in greatest happiness for greatest numbers. They believe an action is right as long as it contributes to happiness or pleasure. An action is morally wrong or unacceptable if it contributes to pain or suffering. In the context of climate change, utilitarians believe that action is only those policies or action should be pursued that contributes to greatest happiness and minimizes harm. If you are a deontologist, you look at climate change policy making from a duty perspective. You will talk about we as individuals and we as society collectively have a duty, have a moral obligation to reduce greenhouse gases. We have an obligation to mitigate 
the climate change effect. So the word here is obligation, individual and collective obligations. The third perspective focuses on character, virtues. It talks about how the character qualities like compassion, wisdom, should guide our actions towards environment and climate change. So this is more about focusing on our character qualities that should inform our decisions. It's time we got into understanding the ethical issues that plague climate change. Let's start with these issues one by one. Humans are very interesting creatures. When things go wrong, we like to blame somebody. Same is the case with climate change. As things are going wrong, we are trying to find somebody to be blamed. Who's to be blamed here? Should we blame the individuals? Or should we blame the nations or communities collectively? That's the first big issue we have in climate change ethics. Responsibilities. Who should you make responsible? And just for example, imagine you go to office every single day for 20 years by driving a car. So for last 20 years, you've been contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. So can I hold you responsible for climate change? Or should we make the nations collectively responsible? It's the most vexing question we have in climate change ethics. I wonder what's your take in this. Do share your thoughts in the comment section. Individual responsibility or collective responsibility. Interestingly, Kyoto Protocol reflects on the notion of collective responsibility. But I would like to listen to your take. How do you see this whole issue? Just imagine a situation. We're all living in 2024. Do you think you owe anything to somebody who's not yet born and who's going to be born in 2060? 2060, just imagine. Do you owe them something? Now, this issue is called intergenerational justice. Do you think we all need to be fair to somebody who's unborn right now and the person will be born in future? That is 2060. Do you think we owe people of future generations clean air? Do you think we owe people of future generations something called clean water? Do you think we owe future generations something called robust environment, a clean planet Earth? Do we owe them all of it? Don't you think it's right that we just take care of our needs? Why are we worried about somebody who is born in 2060? Do you think we need to be fair to them? Just think about this. Let's come down to the next who? And this who happens to be, who's to bear the cost? The first who we looked at was who's to be blamed. Now this who is about who will bear the burden for cleaning up the environment. Historically, developed countries have contributed maximum to greenhouse gas emissions. Should they be made responsible for cleaning up? Should they bear the burden? Or developing countries also should shoulder a little bit of responsibility. Why? Because they are also contributing. One of the most vexing questions in international policy making is this only when it comes to climate change. Who should bear the burdens and who should benefit out of it? Global warming or extreme weather does not distinguish between humans and non-humans. It's going to impact all species. Climate change does not know that, oh, I just have to affect the humans. Why? Because they were, they were the ones who contributed maximum to greenhouse gases. No, they don't do that. Climate change doesn't do that. It impacts everybody. So the larger question is, do we have a moral responsibility for others also, other species also? So the big question is, when I say climate justice, should this be only about humans? Or should it include other species as well? Besides these issues, which I just outlined, we also have some dilemmas. And these dilemmas have no easy answers. Let's explore two such ethical dilemmas. The first big ethical dilemma which a policymaker has to face is this. What should they prioritize? Economic development, economic growth, or environmental sustainability. It's a big trade-off. And what is, uh, what is interesting is every single policymaker all over the world has this issue, has to confront this issue. Because economic growth comes with industrialization. And industrialization will entail some kind of environmental damage, will entail greenhouse gas emission. So what should I prioritize? And developing countries like India have this big, massive challenge. 
Why? Because these countries aspire to give their citizens a very good quality of life, an improved standard of living. And this improved standard of living will come at some environmental price. The next big dilemma that policymakers face is this. Immediate needs. There are, there are issues that will require a policymaker's urgent attention. For example, there's a health crisis. It requires immediate attention, immediate investment, immediate needs. Or there's an economic crisis where I have to focus on recovery, not on sustainability. So it's a big challenge for policymakers to balance immediate needs, urgent action versus sustainability of future actions. So one of the dilemmas that affects everybody is my immediate need should I prioritize or should I prioritize the needs of future generation or future needs? What should I prioritize? Climate change initially was always seen as an environmental issue. But over the years, it has slowly changed or transformed into something of a human rights issue. Yes, you heard me right. Human rights issue. Simon Kenny wrote a very influential paper called Climate Change, Human Rights and Moral Threshold, where we equated climate change, protection against climate change as a human right. Interesting perspective, right? Protection against climate change as a human right. To build his argument, Kenny points to documents like the Mali Declaration on Human Dimension of Global Climate Change and the 2008 Human Rights Council resolution recognizing the threat climate change poses to human rights. Simon Kane identified three critical rights under threat. The first right is right to life. What he's saying is climate change affects right to life the maximum. The next right he talks about is right to health. And the third right he talks about is right to subsistence. Recently, in April 2024, Supreme Court also endorsed a similar perspective where protection from climate change as a fundamental human right. Supreme Court, in a landmark judgment, pointed out that protection against climate change is a fundamental right because this right is intertwined with right to life and right to equality, which which are guaranteed by the Constitution. I have outlined the ethical issues and the dilemmas and Supreme Court's recent initiative. Let me come down to moral responsibilities we as individuals have. Let me ask you a question. Me and you as individuals, can we do something to mitigate climate change effects? Or society collectively acting together is more effective. What is more effective? me and you taking action or the society collectively taking action? What is more effective? Think about it. Do share your thoughts on this. Now, off a lot of scholars have been talking about something called green virtues. When I say green virtues, now these scholars encourage individuals, that is me and you, adopting a lifestyle which is sustainable, adopting a lifestyle which is environmental friendly. For example, we we need to change our consumption habits, reduce dependence on plastics. For example, next time when you go shopping, don't carry a plastic bag from the shop that, I mean, where you're shopping. Carry a cloth bag from home. Adopt a sustainable lifestyle. That's the message, green virtues. And the biggest green virtues is temperance. Balance your consumption. We should not become consumerist. Look at minimalism. What we need is minimalism. Reduce dependence on plastics. Minimalistic lifestyle. We explode oh, climate change ethics from a global perspective. Let's look at from Indian perspective now. Let's see how, what are the ethical values or what are the ethical perspectives that guides Indian policies towards climate change. Now everything starts, everything is anchored in our constitution. Article 48A of the constitution points out the state shall endeavor to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard the forests and wildlife of the country. Besides the constitution, we have national environmental policy that was announced in 2006 and we have a national action plan for climate change also. These are government of India initiatives. Let's leave this aside. Let's come down to citizens, we as Indians, what we can do. Let's look at 
how constitution guides citizens also. And there's a very interesting article called Article 51A that focuses on duties, that talks about the duties citizens have towards environment. Protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and wildlife, and to have compassion for living creatures. Let's travel to Punjab, Fazalka, a small town in Punjab. As the town started growing, people's commute habits also changed. Earlier, people used cycle rickshaws to travel within the city. But now people started moving towards two-wheelers. As people started moving towards two-wheelers, the number of two-wheelers increased. And as the number of two-wheelers increased, two things happened. One, the city roads became congested. And two, the pollution levels started rising. Now, it's during this time, a very interesting non-profit started a small initiative. The initiative was to bring cycle rickshaws back into circuit so that they can tackle the issue of pollution and at the same time provide livelihood to cycle rickshaw pullers. They created a small mobile platform. Yes, you heard me right. Mobile platform called EcoCab where you can hail a cycle rickshaw. Just like you hail a Uber, you can hail a cycle rickshaw. And this initiative became so successful that it changed, slowly it started changing the commute habits of people of Fazilka. People started using the cycle rickshaws more. Now, this is a very interesting ground level initiative to promote sustainable commute and sustainable lifestyle. Speaking of Fazilka, I have a small request. If you come across any such ground level local community initiatives on sustainable living or sustainable commutation, do share in the comments section. That's all for today. Happy learning.